Энди Тач. Энди является ведущим евангелистом по приложениям Unity. Приветствуем Энди. Энди. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I was just saying to David, I have to give away two licenses now because doing the talk after the CEO giving away a license is quite a tricky thing to do. Um, so in this talk, for the next hour, I'm going to be talking about the brand new GUI system in Unity, which isn't released yet, soon, hopefully. Um, so I'm going to be covering those, and I'm going to be covering a variety of topics. So one of the first topics I'm going to talk about is current systems. I'm going to talk about what the current methods are for creating GUI in Unity. So those are built-in methods, third-party methods. I won't go over this too much, because you all pretty much know them already, hopefully. Um, then I'll be going into the new Unity uh, GUI system, so I'll be showing off the canvas, how to render things in the world space and the screen space, um, how to set up visual UI elements, how to interact with those UI elements, and then to how to order them as well. So then the goal of this talk is that by the end of it you'll have a pretty good introduction to the new Unity uh, GUI system, and that when it comes out you'll have a nice starting sort of run at it, um, and be able to have a little play. So I do this before, every, um, before I sort of go into the meat of every talk, and I'd like to find out a bit more about you guys. So put your hand up if you're a programmer. So one or two of you then. Okay, cool. So put your hand up if you're an artist. Okay, a couple of people. Okay, so programmers and artists, your best friends, right? And no one laughed. Okay, cool. Um, put your hand up if you're a student. Ah, okay, cool. So there's like well, one or two people, cool. Um, it's a school day, so yeah, um, awesome. Uh, put your hand if you're from Russia. Wow. Unfortunately, I don't know Russian that well. Uh, they were trying to teach me Russian yesterday for this whole talk. Um, I learned uh, Pribyat. I probably pronounced that wrong. Um, yeah, so people laugh. So it either means hello or they've tricked me. Cool. Um, so just Background information myself, I know it's very early and you're all game developers, you normally wake up about 1 p.m., right? Yeah, um, so I like using this picture to wake everyone up. So my name is Andy Touch, um, I'm based in the UK and I'm a product manager. So you all know Oleg, I guess. He's, yeah, no, some people don't know Oleg. Yeah, so I'm kind of like Oleg, but not Oleg. I'm like the equivalent of him more for Western Europe. Um, so I travel around and I show off new features in Unity, um, give demonstrations, workshops, and basically help developers make their games better and show off new features and get them to play around with it. So um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking about the new GUI system, which I know a lot of people have been waiting for for a long time. It's been promised for a long time, and hopefully it will come out soon. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to show you a beta version of the GUI software, which is fairly far into the testing stage. They are still tweaking and playing with a couple of things, but you'll see when I demo it that it's actually at a stage where I can actually show it off, and there will be some more content over the coming weeks um, about it. So this is kind of a bit of history. So I remember when I first started using Unity three years ago, and I was using GUI game objects. So these are just the game objects you add, such as GUI text and GUI, GUI, game object, uh, GUI texture. And it just renders it in the screen space, but not actually in the world space, which is basically everything in Unity. It's all visual, and you can edit it in the scene view, because that's your canvas to um, edit and design things. So you have here, you have your text being rendered in the scene view, and you have your texture here, but you have it nowhere to be seen here. So there's some pros and cons with this. The pros are artists, can, they can bring their beautiful art in, they spend time drawing, and they can bring it in and say, yes, my art is in the game, it's there, it's being rendered, I can have my health bar in the top left-hand corner, I can have my icon in the top right-hand corner, it's great. But then the programmers are like, wait, I have to code everything, I have to do all the interaction, what, why does the GUI texture squash when I do a health bar and stuff like that? So, so the artists love it and the programmers sort of, they're, they're in two minds about it. So there's another way on GUI, so writing everything from scratch, writing all the code, so you define the area, you define whereabouts it's drawn from, its corner, its width, 
Um, so programmers are like, yes, I can do everything. I can draw everything. I can set it up how I like it to be. But artists are like, where is my art? I can't actually see it until the game is running. You know, I can't set up things. And so, I mean, there's kind of a divide there. And in the end, it's like David was saying that, you know, the uh, wealth of collaboration. We want programmers and artists to work in unison. We want the artists to create beautiful UI art, and then the programmers to implement it and do things with that UI art, such as a slider, which looks amazing, has a nice handle, has a nice fill area, pushing some form of value in your code or some form of value in your game. So um, I remember when I first started using Unity in Unity 3, and I remember seeing an announcement that the GUI was out soon, and I guess some people sort of got a bit bored of waiting, and they made their third-party plugins. So who here uses NGUI? Okay, cool. So the guy who made NGUI actually made all the framework for our new UI system, so he came aboard, he took all the things he didn't like about NGUI, what he could sort of improve and sort of like change if he could rewrite from scratch, and basically built that natively into the engine, which is pretty amazing. And there's lots of other GUI alternatives, but eventually we had to sort of come out with our own one. So from Unity 4.6, so the next version of Unity is 4.5, which comes out soon, 4.6 and beyond, so Unity 5 and so on and so forth, will have the new UI system, and you'll be able to use it and build all your games, which is pretty amazing. So the start of the UI system is the canvas. This is kind of like the bread and butter. Like if you don't know this or how the canvas works and how to treat it, your whole UI kind of like falls. So the canvas is the define, uh, defines the root area for your UI. So you draw out your canvas, you specify where your canvas is and how it reacts to your screen sizes, and all your UI is drawn onto that canvas. So you think of it like a painting canvas. You have your canvas, which is a certain size or is a certain scale and then you draw all of your UI or your paint onto that canvas. And the amazing thing about the canvas is you can toggle it between a 2D screen space, so it's overlaid on top of all your sort of game content. So it could be a health bar, it could be a menu to go through and select different things. It could be a button in the corner to open up your inventory. Um, it could be a pop-up that says, oh, you're, um, don't go down this way, or you need to go find a sword, or something like that. So that, it can all be rendered in the screen space, and I'll show you how to do that. The other amazing thing is you can toggle the canvas into world space and actually position it like it's a game object somewhere in your scene. So if you, um, who has played Dead Space? So Dead Space has the 3D UI that pops up. That You can create something like that using your UI, uh, Unity GUI system. So the world space toggles the canvas from rendering onto the screen and taking in the screen size into the world space and you can position it accordingly. So you could have a panel in your game or a vending machine, your user could walk up, interact with that vending machine using all the built-in UI system, and then walk away. So you can actually toggle this back and forth. It's very quick to change. So if I go in, I'm going to make a new scene. So currently I have nothing in my scene, and nothing in my scene view. Um, so if I go to game object to the top, they finally renamed it from create other to create general, which is a big, big change. Um, underneath here, we have the option to create UI as well. And what you'll notice is, like all the other objects in Unity, such as cubes or directional lights, is there's loads of pre-built-in you know, components, pre-built-in objects which you can bring into your game and then can tweak and toggle. So if I go to Create UI, you'll notice that there's a couple of buttons, texts, sliders. These are kind of like pre-built-in ones to see how the developers have you know, set up a basic slider. And then you can chop and change these. So I'll be doing that a bit later on. I'll be bringing in the default slider and then changing that out for my own art. So if I create a canvas, what you'll notice is it'll draw an area. Can you guys at the back see that? Yeah, okay, they're sort of, yeah, they're sort of thumbs. Oh, okay. Really cool. There's clapping for changing to the basic layout. Cheers, Carl. <laughs> so we have here, we have the canvas. And what you'll notice with the canvas is whilst in 2D mode, um, the canvas is being rendered as an object actually visual in your scene somewhere. Whereas beforehand, if we created a, um, uh, just a standard GUI texture, we can see it's being rendered in the scene view, but actually in the game view, it's like, if we actually focus in, that's you know, it's not visual, it's like everything else in Unity, where you bring it into your scene view, you sculpt up your scene, and then you publish it and push it to the, um, 
to the, to the game view. So what you'll notice is that whilst in 2D mode, we can actually take the scene view and edit it like it's an actual canvas. So those who used After Effects before, or Flash, or any other sort of 2D authoring system, we can bring in new elements and draw it and paste it into this canvas. And one thing you'll also notice is that we have another handle, um, we have another handle atop, across the top here. So we have panning, we have moving, rotation, scale, and we also have this, which toggles on and off the 2D Rex tool. So for example, Whilst in, um, whilst in 3D mode, we can actually toggle on and off this rectal handle and actually edit things all within you know, the 2D system. So those of you that have used the current 2D tools to create some used 3D meshes to create you know, mountains and hills in the background and props in your 2D game, you can actually toggle on and off the 2D tools whilst in 3D mode, which is pretty amazing. So we have the canvas like so. So the canvas has been drawn automatically at a certain size. And that size is based on this game view here. So as I scale the game view, what you'll notice is the canvas actually scales depending on that game view and all the UI elements accordingly. So it's actually taking in whatever size you're previewing that game view at. And it's, the game view is kind of like driving the values of the canvas. So for example, if I take my canvas, uh, take my game view, and I preview what, if I was making I know, a really small web player game, so 300 by 250, you'll notice that the canvas is automatically resized to that size. So it's changing and chopping and changing based on your game view, what it's going to look like in the end. So I'm now going to have a look over here. So what you'll notice is that rather than using the standard transform properties, which were 3D, so X, Y, Z, there's a new rect transform components. This is for any UI element. And the rect transform component draws it at pixel size if it's rendered to the screen. So you'll notice here, because I set my game view as 300, okay, it's kind of cut off, but 300 by 250, what you'll notice is that the canvas here is being drawn and sort of being scaled based on that particular value. So if we go down, we've got a couple more components on the canvas. So one is render mode. I'll talk about the others a bit later on. So the first one is render mode. So currently it's being rendered as a screen space overlay. So it's overlaying everything that's going to be in our game. So if I had some cubes or I had some art or I had some beautiful scene, everything that's drawn onto this UI view is being rendered over the top of that. So that's overlay, and it renders it all orthographically. If I change it to screen space camera, it's going to render it perspectively. So I can actually have UI that kind of like swivels in and out, like 3D UI. If I change it to world space, that is now a 3D world UI. I can now position that somewhere in my game. I can edit it. I can do all sorts of things. I can take it. I can rotate it. That is now a panel that I can put somewhere in my game and have some interactive sliders and buttons that my player can walk up and interact with, which is pretty amazing. However, I'm going to stick to screen space overlay first. I've got some other good demos later on um, showing that. Cool. Awesome. So we have our canvas, and the way that we draw our UI elements onto the canvas is by making children. So if I go to game object, create empty child of this canvas, what you'll notice, hang on, let me just change that. So what you'll notice is it'll create an empty game object onto the canvas, and we have now, rather than this standard sort of 3D gizmo, it automatically adds a rec transform handle onto there, and we have our rec transform tools here. So canvases are built up of lots of several, you know, objects holding other objects. So you can have your canvas, you can have one in the top left-hand corner holding, you know, a health bar. We could then, for example, have another one in the top right-hand corner holding, you know, your every play like webcam face in the corner of the game. You can do all sorts of things with this canvas. So you can actually have several canvases holding other canvases and all their data. And the way that this um, edits and moves is based on this scale here. So you guys are all smart. I'm not going to explain how a 2D handle moves. You can scale it perspective, and you'll notice that it's actually scaling based on the pixel size. So as opposed to this arbitrary with the GUI texture, uh, position is kind of like 0.5 by 0.5 and then you know you set it to zero and it's sort of like slightly cut off and it's kind of a bit all strange. If your UI designer creates a health bar that's going to be 300 by 200 in the top left hand corner, so 300 by 200, that is going to be 300 by 200 in the end when we build our game in the end. So it's actually taking the art that the you know, UI designers created and bringing it in and making it look like how it should. So we can position it like so. Um, we can rotate it, so we can do all the standard things with UI, which you can do with the other uh, system. 
Um, we can also edit the pivot point. So I could change this pivot point, move it to the top, for example, top right hand corner, and actually have my UI kind of like slide in, for example. So you can set up all these different things however you want. So one of the interesting things is um, these handles here. So our alpha team, uh, well, our alpha testers called them the flower, which I don't think our developers like that very much. So they changed it from yellow to white, but that's still a flower color, so yeah. And what this does is it defines where the UI is anchored. So for example, if I take this UI and put it into the top right hand corner and set that there, now what you'll notice is that as I scale my sort of game view, it's always going to be anchored from that particular point. That is where the anchor is. I think it's going to be called officially like anchor point, but I'm going to call it flower. So yeah, we have our flower in the corner. So if I wanted my UI instead to anchor, for example, about there, and you'll notice that as you move it, it actually changes like that. So what you'll notice is that as it actually moves, it's going to scale it based on that anchor point. That is the origin of where it's going to be scaled from. So some of you are probably thinking, OK, that's pretty cool. You can actually position it around. But actually, the amazing thing is, is you can take this flower and you can split it so it actually scales based on the percentage of the screen. So if I take this, I can actually grab the flower and I can say, this UI element will scale based on the fact it's going to be 50% of the screen. So say like we've got a big menu. Um, let me do that. So now, as my game view changes, it will always be 50% of the screen. So if you're designing a game for, for example, an iPhone and it's very small and you have UI that's perhaps 80% of the, you know, the width of the screen and you built it to a big long monitor, it will then be 80% of there. It's basically scaling it across all the different values. So you'll notice that with, when I change it to that 300 by 250, my game object is instantly scaling based on that change. So actually, yeah, the flower allows you to define sort of what its width and what its height is. You can also grab out sections of the flower, so I can actually say it's going to scale 100% of the entire screen. So say like that's a big background, and as actually I change the game view, it's going to scale with that. So the flower is kind of defining what the percentage of the, its parent it's going to change, which is pretty cool. So if I take my flower and I put it in the corner, um, currently everything I've done so far is very bland, so I'm going to talk about the visual UI elements. So we have several visual UI components, so things you're actually going to render and actually be drawn and seen in the canvas. So we have images, so those are from the sprite type, which I'll show you how to import. You can also have text, obviously, and you can also have raw images, so those are just standard textures or render textures. So you could have, for example, a, um, a canvas in the top right hand corner using a render texture from a camera, so it's kind of like a security camera in your game, or you can have like a mini map, or anything that you're using render texture for, you can have positioned in the corner, which is quite amazing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this one of sprites, and what you can use is the 2D, um, the 2D sprite system. So put your hand up if you've used the built-in 2D sprite system. Okay, a couple of people, that's okay. Um, so what the 2D team did is after they sort of finished making the 2D tools and you know they, they were making the next steps, is they kind of had a little insight into the GUI team. They kind of said, we need to, you know, making a 2D system and a GUI system. It's not going to make sense if they use two different things. So actually you can use the same sprite editor you used to cut up all the 2D sprites for the 2D system for the GUI system. So you can bring in your sprite sheet, cut every single 2D sprite you're going to use in your game, your platforms, your character, and your UI, and actually use exactly the same system, because so it wouldn't make sense to do it any other way. So I have my object here, like so. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a component. And what you'll notice in the component menu here is we have several options, several new options. We have layout, event, and UI. But I'm going to target UI first. So UI you'll notice is that we have lots of pre-built-in UI handles. So these are just things that you normally use. So for example, a button to change something, an input field to fill in some text, a scroll bar, a slider, selection list, you know, a toggle, all the sort of base things you need for UI. Now this is extensible. You can create your own custom UI components. So I could make a component that adds to this list and basically will make your UI detect drags and handles and things like that. I'll talk about that later. So I'm going to say to this image, have the UI component of image, and what you'll notice is it asks for a couple of things. It asks for a source image, a color, a material, so you can actually take the 3D material and apply to it. You could take a 3D material which has 
the um, I know, normal map, put some specular shininess onto it, place it onto it, so when your character walks up to your 3D world panel and it's not shiny and everything else is shiny, you can actually apply material onto it to make it shiny, for example. And it's going to ask for an image type as well. So I'm not just going to stick to using white. Um, I've already got the DevGAN logo, so I'm going to use that. So I've imported it as a PNG. Um, when I imported it as a texture, you notice that you have a new option, so sprite 2D slash UGUI. And I'm going to import that as a single individual sprite. And what you'll notice is that I can take my game object, take my sprite from my project folder, and then I can assign it like so. So this is where the artist complains. They say, what's happened to my beautiful art? I hope the guy who's made the DevGam logo isn't here right now, because he'll probably be saying, oh, you kind of squashed it and it looks all horrible. Well, one useful thing in the UI system is that we have a button here called set native size. So what this does is it takes the size of our UI, so in this case, 1024 by 316, that's the imported texture. Clicking set native size will automatically scale it to that size, which in this case is massive, and what you'll notice is that it's actually filled up the whole screen. So you can bring in buttons, set native size, and it will look exactly, it will be exactly the same size that the UI design and designer had. You keep them happy because you want them to be happy. They make your games look beautiful. So obviously we can also scale it, and you have all sorts of these properties. So what you'll notice is currently the image type is of simple. So that means if we scale it, it's going to squash, it's going to look, you know, not look too best, it's going to look a bit horrible, and so on and so forth. So what we can do is we can actually change this type to a different type of image that we're rendering. And we've got a couple of options here. So simple allows you to scale it, and it will scale, you know, like you normally scale it, so you can make things squashed, you can make things sort of look like that. If you set it from simple to preserve aspect, and then take your UI. So what you'll notice, what you'll notice is that as you, okay, that's horrible, hang on. So what you'll notice is that, as you, oh my god. <laughs> okay, it's in beta, okay, okay? You're at game developers, you understand this. But what you can notice is that as I scale it, it's actually, it, well, technically it's still preserving that aspect, it's still scaling accordingly to this size. So you can have a button in your corner, and then as it scales based on the percentage of the screen, it will scale its perspective. It's, in this case, it's sort of, it's still doing it. Okay, cool, let me off. Okay, so another one is tiled. So we can actually now have, for example, an image, and then we can tile it over and over and over again. So you can have some form of checker, and then you can basically tile it, and you can base it on the percentage of the screen. So what you'll notice is that if I then scale it down, and then position it like so, I can actually have, if I was setting up the percentage of the, uh, based on the game view, you can actually have your sort of image tile automatically. And it does it seamlessly. You won't have a weird one pixel gap or some weird, you know, black line. It does it based on, you know, the image. Um, another thing is filled. I quite like this one. Where is it? Okay. The DevCam logo didn't want to fill. Okay, that's fine. Okay, it's in beta, all right? Let me off. Okay, never mind. So, um, uh, this is how a file bug report. Yeah, I'll show you guys how to do that. Um, so, with filled, this is how you'd create, for example, a slider or a scroll bar. So we can define the fill of which direction it's going to go from. So for example, in this case, I'm going to fill it from horizontally. I'm going to set my fill origin to be from the left. And then what I can do is I can then set the fill amounts. What it's going to do is fill. OK. This is what I get for showing stuff in beta. OK, ignore that. Cool. Um, I guess. So there's, there was another option, and that's um, sliced. And what you'll notice is, as I create my image as sliced, let's check if the DevCam logo works, okay. As I select my image as sliced, it's saying the image doesn't have a border. So some people ask me, okay, so what if I want a UI element, and I want it to actually do a nine slice? So that means each corner will preserve its size and aspect, and then across the top it's gonna scale its width, and across the sides it's scale its height, and the middle is just gonna scale automatically. We can do that all with the sprite editor system. So if I select my blue UI sprite sheet here, so I have a big, you know, nice UI, I've imported it as a sprite. 
I'm going to set it from single to multiple, and I'm going to open up the sprite editor. What you'll notice is with the sprite editor, this is kind of like your step in between bringing your textures in, importing them as sprites, and then slicing them up and then bringing them into your game. So it's kind of like the chopping board for your sprites. So what I can do here is I can go into an individual sprite and then define that as a cut for us to use. So I want to find a nice nine slice. So I can drag out that area there, like so, and then that will then be a sprite when imported. So I could, for example, go through and cut every single one of these, um, and then the artist in the studio then drinks some energy drinks and then draws about 600 more, and then it gets very boring as I'm slicing hundreds and hundreds of sprites. Or you can go to this top corner, which you can't see, um, go to the top corner, and you have the option to slice everything automatically. So it looks through the sprites, finds at least a one pixel gap, boom. So what you'll notice is that actually every single one of these sprites has now been sliced up and ready for use in my game, which is fairly quick. So I'm going to pick this particular one here, so I want that to scale automatically. Now what you'll notice is if I click apply, and then I leave my sprite editor, underneath my sprite texture here, as I open it up, I then have all my individual sprites all ready to use in my UI system or in a 2D game. But they're all named sort of, you know, blue, blue UI sprite sheet underscore zero underscore one underscore two, which is, um, you know, not that really going to be that useful for me. So what I can do is I can actually zoom into one particular element, so in this case this one, I can name it something, so in this case, blue uh, button, and I can click apply. So in clicking apply, what you'll notice is that my sprite sheet will now have a blue button there. So if I had, for example, 600 UI elements, I don't want to go through all 600 to find which one's a slider handle. I can now actually just go directly to blue button and then apply that. So if I take my UI element, assign blue button, you'll notice that I have a big blue button, like so. And I'll scale that down. Well, let's actually use the set native size. So what you'll notice, I have my blue button like so. However, if I scale it, it looks horrible. It sort of looks too bad. So what if I want my button or my area to scale based on the screen size, but not sort of go into this horrible sort of weird aspect? Well, if I actually go back to my sprite editor, and then I zoom into my blue button, so in this case here, what I can do is I can actually define a border around it to work out a nine slice. And I can do that in a couple of ways. I could go down to this bottom values here and set up these values to slice based on the border. So for example, I could fill in, you know, from the left it's five, no, actually it's seven, uh, it's going to be seven from there, and so on and so forth. So it'll actually slice it like a typical nine slice, where each of the corners will maintain its size. The top will scale by the width, the sides will scale by the height, and the middle area will actually scale automatically based on the area. So if I didn't like inputting those values, and you're like me, you like to be a bit more hands-on and sort of like drag things around, you can actually take these sort of sliders and then scale them uh, manually like that. So I've got that. I'm going to click Apply. So what you'll notice is that with my game object, if I set it to be sliced, it will automatically, as I scale it, it's then going to preserve the aspect corner of each of these sort of sides and the corner, and we will then be able to have UI that actually scales automatically. So if I take my flower and then I dragged it out and then I said, okay, so I'm pretty happy with my UI looking like that. As I change my game view, it's gonna scale automatically with my game view. It's gonna keep all the corners. You don't have some horrible, you know, you design it for iOS and you put it on a massive screen and then it's gonna, you know, look horrible and sort of scale up and look bad. Cool. So I've taken my game object. Um, I've placed it like that. And I'm gonna call this blue uh, background. So the next sort of thing I'm going to focus on is text. Now, I could probably talk about the entirety of the new GUI system, and it will take up the whole day, for example. But I'm just going to focus on you know, the specific sort of smaller things. So I'm going to make a child of this blue background area. And what you'll notice is that when I bring in the text, it will also have the anchor handles. So currently, I could take this text, anchor it to the top left-hand area of this blue background. So then as I move this blue background around, or as I, for example, scale my blue background, the text is always going to sort of sit in the top left-hand corner because that's where its anchor is. 
And with the text, I have lots of options. So for example here, I could write something nice in the text for you guys. So, hello, Moscow. Um, I won't write prim yet. Oh dear. I don't think I have the character keys. I can set up a new font, so I can go into my font folder and then set up, for example, the Unity font or uh, the Clavica font. Um, I can even do rich text, so that allows me to write some HTML code into my text and sort of highlight particular areas. So I'm going to say, hello, Moscow, and then I'm going to, for example, I can bold this Moscow text. So yeah, hello, Moscow. I could then sort of go a bit wild and then, you know, set the size to be 50. Well, so there we go. So we have a massive hello, Moscow text. I'm going to get rid of that because that's horrible. Cool. Um, I can also sort of, uh, do, I can do color, I can do underline, so you can actually highlight specific areas of your text and then do things like that. Um, the other thing with the text is it automatically uh, wraps around based on if it's horizontal overflow or not. So I set this to be overflow and then I took this text and I just copied and pasted over and over again. It's going to extend outside the box that I've defined it as. However, if I set my horizontal overflow to wrap instead, what you'll notice is that it'll actually say, hello, Moscow, hello, Moscow, hello, Moscow. So if I copied and pasted in a paragraph of text, it's automatically going to wrap around for it. And what you'll notice is that if I set my flower to be, you know, 100% width, for example, as I actually change this sort of unscale it, what you'll notice is actually the text is sort of changing automatically based on that sort of percentage. So you can actually, you know, make sort of responsive UI, which is pretty sweet. Um, you can also set up other things. So you could set up, for example, a material. So you can apply a 3D material or something you'd apply onto a mesh onto your text. So you can have it, you know, have a shadow, have it shininess, things like that. Um, there's also built-in shadows and outlines. So I can say to all of my text, have a shadow of, I know, red, um, and then define, you know, the distance. So all my text is now, you know, has a slight shadow like that. Yeah, so you can basically sort of like bring in your text and customize it like that, which is pretty cool. Right, so where's my slides? Okay, so you can bring in text, you can bring in sprites. Setting up a render texture is exactly the same. You just set up and drag and drop your texture into that area. You can bring all these visual UI elements, and that's great. However, if I build that to the App Store, only people who are from Moscow would sort of enjoy this app. I'd get zero stars from just about everyone else because there's no interactivity, there's no nothing. And the way that the UI system has been built in terms of interactivity, so you can turn any visual UI element and drive it by being a button or a toggle or a slide or anything like that, it's left completely open to you. So the current sort of basic built-in event components are buttons, scroll bars, sliders, toggles, selection lists, and maybe a couple of other ones when they sort of, you know, implement it and things like that. So I can take my text, turn that into a button. So when I click on it, it will then do button-like things. I can take my, I can take my sort of background, turn that into a slider, and then have my text as the handle of the slider. So you can take any UI element and point them to sort of in different directions. So for example, the built-in button component will allow you to set a normal highlighted and press state for the target graphic. So a button doesn't operate like you hover over it and then it just stays exactly the same. It will then either resize, recolor, change to a different sprite. When you click on it, it will play a sound, so on and so forth. So you can set up normal highlighted and press states. And then on click, you can send a message or a call to any selected game object. So let's show that. So I, this doesn't look too pretty, so I'm going to get the pretty Pretty seen up. Nah. Cool. So here is currently a canvas. It's being rendered in the world space. So this is a 3D canvas somewhere within our world. And what you'll notice is that there's a simple script. Oh, the bunny is spinning very fast. I'll, I'll, I'll make a slider change that down. And what you'll notice is that it has a script on it. So where the pointer is, it's actually tilting the world canvas. So it's had some rotation. And what you'll notice is that we have a simple UI panel. Um, we have a button at the top here which allows us to go to another panel. So this is a different canvas. So this is sort of a first canvas. And then in clicking this button, it's going to toggle that other canvas off and the other canvas on. So you can actually have canvases within canvases. We also have sliders. So I'll show you how to set up one of these. So we can actually change the sliders and sort of, you know, edit them and move them and push out percentages. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a certain area of my canvas 
So for example, this button, and I'm going to turn it into a button, or this uh, logo, I'm going to turn it into a button. So if I take my text, I'm going to scale the text down, so you'll notice that the word wrap is automatically changing it. You also notice that there's, um, you know, um, hash reference for a particular color, so you can actually set up colors for specific areas, which is pretty, areas of text, which is pretty cool. So and I'm going to take this texture, and I'm going to turn it to a button. So what you'll notice is that all of sort of the textures and things in Unity and all the sprites, they're all driven by different, you know, they're all independent of vertex colors. So if this logo is white, I can then color it blue, red, green, so on and so forth. I can actually change this logo and tint it whatever vertex color you want. So I've got this image here, which is pretty standard. Um, and what you'll notice is, hang on. on here, I've already added a button. So you'll notice that this button is set up like that. And if I add the component, of button, so if I go to UI and then I make it a button, I'm now saying this isn't just being rendered like normal, this now has some form of interactive property. So in this case, it has a transition. So the thing I was talking about, the target graphic. So in this case, it's pointing at the watermark. It's saying when my cursor hovers over it, it's gonna color tint it from a normal white to a highlighted yellow. And then when I push it, it's gonna go to gold. When it's disabled, it's gonna go to gray. So I'm telling where my target graphic is gonna go. So that's great and all. I can then, you know, tint that, I can change it, I can do all sorts of things. So for example, um, if I duplicate that and bring that down, and then I use that other sort of sprite that I used. So what was it? So for example, we, I have this UI sprite element here, um, and set this up as the button. You'll notice that I have this element here, it has a button attached onto it, and there's a target graphic of itself. And you'll notice that underneath the transition, I'm going to make a color tint. So what you'll notice is that as my game runs, if I hover over that, it's actually going to take that blue color and tint it by that color. So I'm just doing a simple color tint here, and when I push it, it's going to change it as well. That kind of looks a bit bland, so I want to sort of play around with it a bit more. So if I take that first color area, I can actually change it so it doesn't color tint, it does a sprite swap. So that's really simple. It's basically saying, when I hover over it, swap out the sprite for a new sprite. When I push it, swap out the sprite for another sprite. So if you're a UI designer, create separate sprites for your hovered, push down, highlighted, things like that states. You can actually swap those in and out. Um, the amazing thing, though, is animation. So if I set it to, anim set it to animation, what it will do is it'll allow me to auto-generate a mechanism state machine for my button. So the animator which you normally use for you know, bipedal characters and state machines, you can actually drive all the UI elements or their hovered and highlighted states by that. So if I click auto generate animation, it's gonna ask me to call it something, so I'm gonna call this watermark controller. You'll notice that there's a controller now attached onto my button. And then if I bring up the animator window, like so, Oh, cool, we have a whole state machine just for my specific sort of, okay. I have a state machine just for my specific button. So I can actually see that it's highlighted and see that it's not highlighted. So you'll notice that when I run my game and I set my watermark, oh look, cool, I have a state machine running and when I hover over it, it's highlighted, normal, highlighted. So you can actually bring in animation clips and animation sort of like data and actually drive your UI by that. So if you didn't like a color tint, which is fairly simple, or a sprite swap, which is again kind of simple, you can actually use Mechanium to kind of like draw, uh, drive all these sort of animation states, which is pretty sweet. Um, yeah. And when it spurs, it kind of just resizes. And then we can go in. I could bring up the animation window and actually change that. So when I pushed it, it kind of like rotates and you know, any sort of like UI element or anything you want to animate, you can actually have driven by this sort of controller, which is cool. Right, I'm running out of space on my screen. Cool. So I'm going to get rid of that button, and I'm just going to treat this logo as my button. So what you'll notice is because I've added it as a button, it then has an option for on-click. So with on-click, what I can do is I can actually drive some form of command on a different script or a different object. So if I add to this list, what's going to happen is it's going to ask me for an object. So in this case, I drag and drop an object in here. So for example, I'm going to drag and drop the bunny that's in the background, the one that's spinning. So what you'll notice is 
this one here. Oh, what you'll notice also is, like I was saying earlier on, you can also use the 2D sort of rec tool in 3D mode and edit 3D objects. So you can then go, you know, scale it using the 2D system, um, which is pretty cool. Sorry, buddy. And if I go back to my button, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my button, I'm going to direct a message to my bunny, and then underneath here, I have all the functions of what I can do or what I can command my bunny to do. So what you'll notice is I have all the components on my bunny. I can go to the game object. I could change its tag, for example. I could change its name. I could broadcast a message of a string. I could set its layer. If I go to transform, I can tell it to look at a particular thing in my scene. I could go to its mesh renderer and I could set its material, for example, on click. I could go to mesh filter and do something like that and set the mesh. So you can actually go and direct things. So if my bunny had an audio source and I clicked it, I could go and mute the audio source, for example, on the click of my button. But what you'll notice is I actually have a script in here called spin, and it has, it's asking for a single. So it's saying change bunny spin speed because it's currently spinning too fast. I'll do that a bit later on. So I'm gonna do something simple. I'm gonna say, when I click the button, go to the bunny, Set the name of the bunny, and I'm going to call it um, Dave. It. Cool. So what you'll notice is that as my game runs, it's currently called Stanford Bunny at the top. But when I go to my UI and click it, oh cool, the bunny's called David. So what it's doing is it's then directing message to there, and it's doing that particular thing. And the amazing thing about this is then I can stack up this list, and I can actually get extra commands in my list, so I can say, not only is it going to name it the bunny David, it's then going to, for example, go to something else, toggle that, go to the light, change that, go to that and change that. So by clicking the button, you can actually run seven or eight different commands and, think, and access functions in other scripts. Now, I find the built-in button is kind of a little limited, so what I might want to do is, on hover over my button, it does something, and on exit of hover over my button, it does something. So I'm going to go to my button, remove it, and it has a built-in sort of component called an event trigger. So the event trigger is kind of like a bare bones example of this UI. So if I go into here, we have, um, cool. So if I go into here, you'll notice we have button and scroll bar and things like that. Those are built-in sort of like components. If you use an event trigger, you can actually call in your pointer data and detect when your mouse is over a particular area or has exited a particular area. So I go over to here. What you'll notice is that on my button is an event trigger. I can add a new event trigger, and I can bring in the pointer enter, pointer exit, pointer down, pointer up, pointer click. If I drag the button, if I drop it, if I scroll on it, if I have a key down, if I have a key up, if I've selected it, if it moves at all, for example, I can get access to all of this data on this particular object. And by pointer, that means your finger, your mouse, or your controller, for example. It's across the whole board. So for example, if I said on pointer enter of my button, um, go to the bunny, um, go to its mesh renderer, and go to its material, I can then set a new material for my bunny. So in this case, I've already got, oh, okay. So for example, I'm gonna make my bunny red. Cool. So if I add another pointer enter, so a pointer exit, it's going to sort of like remember what the other one was, and I'm going to change my bunny white. So you'll notice I'm detecting the pointer data, and when my pointer, my mouse enters it, it's going to change the bunny. So by pointer, it means if I've built it to a desktop device and I have some form of cursor, that's my pointer. If I built it to a mobile device, my finger's my pointer. So it's basically cross-platform in that way. You don't really have to, you know, script in, you know, mouse touch and finger touch and things like that. Pointer is pretty universal. And let's say on pointer down, on my bunny, I'm actually going to go to it and I'm just going to set its name. I'm very adamant it's called David, this bunny. Okay. David H. Guess who that is. So now what you'll notice is that as um, in my scene, My bunny, which is pretty sick right now because he's spinning very fast, is changing to red, and if I click on it, it's changed to David H, for example. Now, whenever I sort of show this off to people, they all say, but we can't see the bunny. The UI is all in the way. What if you want to position it? Well, the amazing thing with this canvas system is everything drawn onto this canvas 
can be edited by lin alpha slider. So instead of changing, for example, 30 different UI elements alpha, for example, you can go to the top level of the canvas, you can actually just go directly, sort of scale it up and down, and basically say, okay, this is dimmed, for example. So now, my canvas is dimmed, I can see my bunny spinning, and it's now called David. So I've got about nine minutes left, so I'll quickly sort of go through this next area. Um, so let's talk about a scroll bar. So if I create my UI, I'm going to create a slider. What you'll notice is that if I just go to Game Object Create UI, there's lots of built-in sort of buttons and things like that. These are kind of like built-in things into Unity that allow you to kind of see how it should be structured or how the designers have structured it. So what I can do is I can create a slider. I can actually go through the slider and see on the slider component, it's asking for a target graphic, so in this case the handle. And it's asking also for what the handle is. It's asking for the direction. It's asking for the minimum and maximum values. And it's asking for all the data relevant to a slider. And you'll notice that as I change the value, that little slider is going to change. So I think my bunny is feeling quite ill, so I'm going to change its minimum value, so it's going to be at a speed spinning of zero. And let's say I'm going to turn it up to 11. No one got the reference. Or maybe a few of you did. So now my slider will range a value where it's going to output a value between 0 and 11. And we can take that in. We can then go to my component here. So in this case, on value changed. I can set up a value. And what that's going to do is it's going to take the slider canvas value and it's going to direct it somewhere. So on my bunny, I have a script. And on that script, what you'll notice is I have a public function which pulls in the float of slider value and then it changes the rotations per second. So if I go to my slider, which is here. Um, I'm going to go to my bunny. I can open this up. And what you'll notice is I've got my behavior of, of spin. I have all the scripts to do with it. I've got change bunny spin speed. It's going to pass in that single. So for example, a toggle will pass in true, false, or zero, one, things like that. Um, scroll bar will toggle how pass in how much you scroll and stuff like that. I'm going to set it to single. So what you'll notice now is my slider is now hooked up to go to the bunny and then set the bunny speed. Now we want to see the bunny. I feel kind of sour, sorry for him. Whoa. But luckily I've made a slider to be able to change this. So what you'll notice is that actually, I can then change it, oh, okay. And he's now called David. So David is now spinning very quickly. So as well as sort of, you know, passing in that slider value to that particular, you know, object, I can then add another one I can then, for example, go to the light in my scene, go to my light, and I can set the intensity of my light as well, which is at the top here. So not only can you sort of pass in that slider value into a function, you can actually pass it into a component which would take, you know, a single value. So currently my scene is way too bright, but thankfully I've made a slider which allows me to change that. So the slider, the scroll bar, text field, they all, you can take all those values and whatever you input them, and change them, and then pass them into wherever you want. I feel sorry for him. Cool, so I've got about five minutes left. Um, okay, cool. So some of you are probably wondering, like how am I catching these events? I mean, I'm dragging my mouse over it, and it's automatically kind of detecting my mouse is in that space. You can do this in a couple of ways. So the graphic event system on the canvas will catch your pointer data whenever it's over a graphic. So if you have a sprite, like this phone here, that is your target area, that is your collider. You can also attach a 3D physics event system. So if you had a panel somewhere in your game world, you can attach 3D colliders onto your buttons, and that will detect the pointer data. You can even do 2D physics as well. So you can have 2D physics colliders positioned where your UI are. Um, cool, one more other thing. So yeah, you can sort of take your UI and then push it wherever you want. Um, one last thing is layout groups. So currently we have a very simple scene here where we have a canvas in the world space. It's got the tilt. Um, and what you'll notice is all these different objects and all these different letters are in this group. And when I click on them, they're pushing them. And they're all using exactly the same sort of animator or animation control system to basically drive those values. So I'm using the exact same controller to basically say, move my UI out from the screen, when I click on it, it's going to go back. So if I could change that one controller that's in all the buttons, all the buttons are ultimately going to have the hover controls. Okay.
So one thing that would be a bit of a pain is if you had your canvas, you had all your UI elements in there, and you had to position them and anchor them all individually, and if you're making a game like League of Legends, you've got thousands and thousands of objects. Well, thankfully, the devs have brought in a grid system. So you take the UI element. Mr. Tesh, you have four minutes left, so basically, if either you show something cool or it was just a question. Show you something cool. Yeah. It's all cool. <laughs> then we're switching to questions. <laughs> okay, I'll show you something cool very quickly. Okay. So all the children of this um, game object, which has a grid layout, you can then set, for example, the size, so they all you know be 200 by 200. And then if I'm on an iPhone screen, it didn't do it. <gasps> it's basically going to take all the grid elements and basically order them in an order. So if I'm on a big screen, it's going to stack them across. If I'm on like an iPhone screen, it's going to stack them small based on the percentage value. So yeah, and that was basically the end anyway. So yeah, okay. um, yeah, that's basically the end. So I mean, I could talk about the UI system all day and show you all the lovely things with it, but hopefully, you know, you've got a good idea of how it works, how it's visual, how you can add things. I'm going to be wandering around, so come find me, pester me, have a play with it. Um, hopefully, I didn't talk too fast and stuff like that. Oh yeah, actually, uh, auditor look to understand you well, so that's perfect. У нас есть время для вопросов. И кто хочет что-нибудь спросить? Sorry, and if you change this programmatically, it will be also after long lag. If you change the size of this panel programmatically, other letters will also lag after lag. I can't quite hear you, sorry. So if I change, if I, for example... Если вот это менять, ну, программно менять вот эту панельчику, она тоже будет вот так вот автоматически делать лайк? Ну... Yeah, yeah. So you want to change this programmatically, so you say this is now 200, this... Yeah, yeah, you can do that. So all those files are... Pardon? And поведение тоже сохранится, да, вот эти буковки? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. And one question about pointer enter event. Can I ask you? So when we work with touch interfaces, pointer enter automatically means pointer down when we touch. UI element. So, how should we work with it, and how should we handle it? Because when we work with mouse, pointer enter, yes, it's pointer enter, and pointer down clicking is pointer down. But when we work with touch interfaces, pointer enter is automatically pointer down. So, pointer enter with a finger yeah. is if you have it, your finger down, and then it comes within, it enters that area, for oh. example. Pointer down and pointer click, and that pointer data basically means click and down, for example. Um, so yeah, pointer enter means your fingers on the screen, and then it enters that area. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cool. Oh, one last thing I forgot to mention is that the canvas um, batches all the UI sprites together, into, so it's actually very performant on mobile devices, not like the old ways. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. I think that's it. We have one more minute, so like last question probably, but like. Last question. I guess the question actually. Last question. Last question. But Andy will not be angry. You will find it. 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 Last question. 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 Растровые шрифты, потому что они оптимальнее гораздо. Вот. То есть, чем отличается тем, что растровые шрифты, они, естественно, это тоже спрайт-шит, и у них определенный размер. К примеру, в моей игре у меня используются три вида шрифтов, три, три спрайт у которого три размера. Вот. А Векторные, они интересны тем, что можно любой размер сделать, как говорится, но это самое. Но в Unity, как бы первоначально, это было очень ресурсоемко. Поэтому во всех T2, Toolkit, NGU и так далее, все генерировалось, всегда создавались 
растровые шрифты. Вот в новом КУИ, как это все решается? Я так понял, тут вы изменяете размер шрифта, изменяется размер самого пикселей, картинки, или вот как это будет все-таки делаться? Все Какой шрифт растровый будет использоваться, это можно будет, или векторный? Вот это очень-очень мучающий вопрос. Okay, so the differences between raster and vector types. So natively, um, vector types aren't really sort of, you can't really import them. It, it's, it's all like bitmap or raster. Um, so the current UI system just uses bitmaps um, or raster. So vectors, it, do, it doesn't support vectors yet. Okay. Um, I think that, come find me afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I can find this guy. He's awesome. He's, he's going to be for the whole day here. So you should definitely talk to him. And, а следующий будет Руслан Григорьев. Он вам расскажет про Android. У него огромное количество опыта в этой платформе. Обязательно оставайтесь, приходите его послушать и зовите друзей. Thanks, Andy.